So tonight I have the privilege, honor, and pleasure of introducing my colleague, Christina Hagen. Of course, Christina Hagen uh, needs no introduction to the regular audiences on Conservation Conversations. She's one of our three hosts here on the series. So those of you who do watch regularly will know her well. For those of you who don't, uh, she's our penguin specialist at BirdLife South Africa. Her official title is the Pamela Isdell Fellow of African Penguin Conservation. And tonight she's going to be telling us about her project, which is re-establishing a penguin colony uh, in the Huop Nature Reserve. So uh, she's come up with a very clever title, which uh, I'm not going to give away now, but given that Christina doesn't actually speak Afrikaans because she didn't <laughs> grow up here, uh, is quite impressive. So Christina, it's great to have you in the hot seat tonight. I know um, having given my presentation a few weeks ago that it can be a bit more nerve wracking on that side of the of the, the screen, but um, we're all very much looking forward to hearing some updates on your project and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, yeah, it does feel a bit different to be this side of the uh, presentation. Um, let me just start sharing. Um, I'm also on just my laptop today because I will have load shedding at eight o'clock. <laughs> so can you see that? Good, okay, then I'll uh, jump right in. So yeah, um, I will be talking to you tonight about my project that has consumed the, the last, I don't know, five or, or more years of my life, uh, which I say that as, it's, as if it's a bad thing, it's not, it's been a, an incredible journey and one that we're still on today. Uh, so yes, I am talking about the hope for penguins, re-establishing a breeding colony uh, for African penguins at the De Hope Nature Reserve. And I'd like just to uh, upfront, I would like to thank the Isdell Family Foundation, in particular Pamela Isdell, for supporting all of this work and my position. So I would, I just want to start with, with reminding everyone of, of where penguins are found, or African penguins. And um, as Andrew mentioned in the, the run-up to, to the webinar, they are the African penguins are the only, is the only species of penguin found in Africa. And uh, they are found only in Namibia and South Africa. Um, and in fact, they breed at 28 colonies and they're split into four regions. Uh, they're up on the screen now. So Namibia, uh, the west coast of South Africa, the southwest coast of South Africa, and the Eastern Cape. Um, and you can see that most uh, of the colonies are in fact on islands. Um, these are just a few of them. Uh, there's Bird Island up in the top left, Robin Island, and then Dyson Island. And those are all uh, sites of, of penguin colonies. And penguins breed on mainly on islands because they are safe from terrestrial, usually mammalian predators, um, such as leopards and caracal and, and other, other creatures that we get on the mainland, which haven't made it out onto our coastal islands. And if you have a look back at the map of the, of the penguin colonies, you can see that there is a big gap uh, between the Namibian population and, and the West Coast population, as well as between the Southwest Coast and the Eastern Cape populations. And, and the reason for this is because just through geography and, and how, how the, the coastline is, there are no islands suitable for penguins to breed on. There, there are one or two uh, rocks, sort of outcrops, that um, are often inhabited by seals, but there's nothing available for penguins to breed on. Uh, now, the South Africans amongst you and even uh, those of you internationally who visited uh, South Africa and Cape Town in particular might be asking, well, what about uh, Boulders Beach at Simonstown or Stony Point in Betty's Bay? Those certainly aren't on islands um, and that's, that's correct. The reason that these colonies exist is because they are surrounded by urban areas or semi-urban areas which have uh, decreased the, the natural abundance of 
uh, these larger predators that would cause problems for the penguins. But that's not to say that um, they're completely predator free. Uh, they have had issues with caracal at, at boulders and, and leopards at, at Stony Point um, in the last five or so years. Um, both those colonies have been hit by, by predators. But luckily, they, um, they didn't cause too much, although they killed quite a few penguins, they didn't cause too much damage and, and the, peng the penguins are still there and still, uh, still breeding. So just to jump a step back and remind everyone that African penguins are in fact endangered. I find it quite surprising that a lot of people don't, especially South Africans, don't know that our only uh, penguin species on the continent is in fact endangered. And you can see in the last 20 years, their population has really decreased quite dramatically. And um, we are now sitting at the lowest that the penguin population has ever been, which is very, very worrying for us and, and why we're pulling out all the stops to try and save them. And uh, part of the reason for the decrease in, in numbers has to do with the uh, that gap in, in the distribution that I mentioned. Um, and it's quite a roundabout explanation, so I will start with uh, one of the, the biggest threats to African penguins. Although they do face, as, as I mentioned, uh, predation and obviously oil spills are quite a, a well-known threat to penguins. Um, the by far the biggest threat currently acting upon the population is a lack of food. So African penguins eat mainly uh, sardines and anchovies and they their population uh, trends have followed that of the fish very, very closely. Uh, and unfortunately in the last more than 20 years or so, the fish distribu distribution has shifted um, which has made things difficult for, for the penguins. So this is what the a, a sort of schematic of what the situation looked like um, in the mid 90s with um, big penguin pop populations on the west coast, good fish abundance there, also uh, a thriving uh, fishing industry. And of course there, there are the colonies in Algoa Bay uh, in near Port Elizabeth with uh, um, also good fish stocks there. But then from about the mid 90s, the distribution of the fish and the sardine and, and to a lesser extent the anchovy uh, shifted away from the west coast and more onto the, the southern Cape coast. And that caused a big problem for the, the penguins uh, because they, when they're breeding, they are tied to their, their colonies, they need to return on a regular basis to feed their chicks. Um, and so they, they can only go at most 40 kilometers from the colony. Um, and this, this also exacerbated the, the problem of competition with the fishing industry, as the fishing industry also had incentives, economic incentives to stay on the West Coast because that's where all their processing plants and harbors are. Uh, so the, that kind of increased the competition between penguins and the fishery. And because of that lack of, of islands that I mentioned um, in the, between the kind of Southwest Cape population, penguin population and the Eastern Cape population, the penguins weren't able to kind of follow the fish and, and move into areas of high fish abundance. And so that is where BirdLife South Africa's kind of started with this idea of creating new colonies is to try and help the penguins move to where the fish are and kind of assist them in, in uh, filling the gap between in, in the distribution of, of penguins in South Africa. So to explain how we go about establishing penguin colonies, um, it might be helpful to do a little bit of life history of penguins. Uh, so penguins lay two eggs usually um, and, and hatch these cute little fluffy chicks and both 
parents are required to uh, to feed the chicks and to, they take turns going out to sea and catching fish and returning to feed the chicks. Um, unfortunately, in the current situation, usually only one of the chicks um, makes it to, to fledging age, which you can see uh, kind of in the middle of the slide there. They are what we call blues. They're sort of blue in color and sort of gray, gray blue. Um, they haven't got their distinctive black and white plumage yet. And when they're um, old enough to, to fledge, when they've got their nice waterproof feathers, they've lost the, the fluffy down of the chicks, their parents will just sort of stop feeding them. And uh, they, they're generally quite fat. If, if their parents have been able to find enough food, they're generally quite fat um, and able to survive for a little bit um, until they Kind of figure out how to to hunt for themselves and um, so their parents will stop feeding them and then they'll get hungry enough to venture off into the sea uh, by themselves and at this point we well science uh, scientists don't really know what they do we, we're starting to get a, a kind of a better glimpse into their um into their movements after some tracking work that uh, richard shirley and his his um, colleagues have done by putting GPS trackers on uh, young fledgling uh, penguins. And you can see the, the tracks there on the, the top right of the screen. Um, it seems like a lot of the penguins go northwards um, up the west coast and all the way into Namibia, uh, which is kind of seems to be a sort of instinctive behavior. Uh, they're potentially following cues of that, that used to indicate uh, the presence of food, but unfortunately no longer does. Um, but this, this just shows their kind of immediate movements when they leave their colonies. Um, and they, uh, after that, we don't really know where they go once the GPS trackers stop working. We get a, a bit of a glimpse into their uh, situation when they come back to land to molt for the first time, uh, usually when after a year has passed. Um, they, they molt into their, their adult plumage um, and don the, the kind of black and white uh, tuxedo of, of an adult. But at that point, they are still not ready to breed. Um, and they will spend uh, a few more years at sea. Um, they generally don't come onto land again until they need to molt, they sleep at sea. Um, and they can do this for a number of years, between three and six years before they are ready to breed. And once that happens, they will uh, well, I should say in that intervening period, they uh, it's likely that they go around visiting other colonies, including their natal colony, um, sort of checking out the, the situation and seeing uh, what the conditions are like in various places. But this is, this is kind of guesswork and, and assumption on our part. Um, and usually they head back to their natal colony uh, where they were hatched in, and, and start breeding there, find a mate and start breeding. However, that is not always the case. And that is something that we are relying on in order to start uh, a new colony. There have been three sort of natural penguin colonizations, uh, Robin Island, Boulders Beach and Stony Point, all started um, spontaneously by the penguins in the, in the early 1980s. Robin Island is actually a recolonization. Uh, penguins bred there until uh, the arrival of Europeans when in, in the Cape when they uh, went locally extinct at that colony uh, due to exploitation by, by humans. Um, but it's nice that they were able to re-establish that colony in the mid 1980s, along with boulders and Stony Point. So we do know that it is possible for penguins to start new breeding colonies. Um, and we've, we've learned from that, those, uh, those three uh, establishments, as well as from 
other seabird colony reestablishment projects around the world. There, there's a huge number of them that have been going on for uh, many years now uh, with a whole range of different species, normally flying birds. Um, one of the most famous examples is the Atlantic puffin in Maine, uh, where they, they started a very successful colony, um, also a reestablishment of an extinct colony. Um, and other work has been done with albatrosses and gannets and, and all sorts of burrowing petrels and, and shearwaters. Uh, New Zealand is quite the, the hub for peng, uh, seabird colony establishment. So we've learned a lot from those projects as well. But you'll notice that most of them are flying birds. Uh, so establishing new penguin colonies is quite unusual. And there are only, I think, uh, two other uh, projects that have even uh, attempted this. So our first step was to identify a suitable location to try and start a new penguin colony. <clears throat> um, and obviously we were looking in the area where there was good uh, fish availability, um, as well as various other characteristics that would make the site easy to protect from predators and have good uh, breeding opportunities for the penguins. And so we decided on the Dohuk Nature Reserve, this peninsula that you can see, or headland that you can see um, on the screen now. And the reason that we chose this site is that it was actually the site of a natural penguin um, breeding attempt in the early 2000s. And uh, it was discovered, I think, around 2003 when there were a couple of penguins uh, starting to, to nest there and there were a few few more that were sort of loafing um, roosting at the site as well as cormorants and swift terns or greater crested terns roosting there as well. Unfortunately um, in a, a few years after the colony sort of got going I think there were there were about 18 breeding pairs um, a caracal also, no, also noticed that there were penguins there and uh, unfortunately caused that breeding, uh, that colonization attempt to be abandoned um, due to that predation. So we, we decided to work here because the, the penguins had already demonstrated that it was a suitable site for them um, and it is in an area of good fish abundance. We know this from uh, fish surveys that the Department of Fisheries does uh, twice a year as well as evidence from the penguins themselves. So these are some tracks that um, my colleague Tegan Carpenter-Kling um, uh, gathered. She is working on the uh, pre and post molt movements of African penguins. So that is once they've finished molting, uh, they need to go to sea to, to regain their body condition after being on, on land for up to three weeks and, and not being able to eat so they're they're very hungry after this and um, and also before the malt they need to to gain enough weight to to survive that period <clears throat> so these birds each different color is a different um, penguin and you can see that once they you know that they've traveled to the Duhok colony which is the um the the yellow star that they are foraging in that area. So there must be good food availability if they're traveling that whole way uh, around for, for the, the orange one, around um, the Cape Peninsula, all the way to to the hook, uh, to forage. So we know that there is good fish availability in the area. And we often, the, the rangers at the Duhup uh, Marine Protected Area often see penguins in the waters around Duhup. So we know that it's a suitable site for them. So then we need to be also be able to manage the native predators so that we don't have the same situation as happened previously. Uh, so I, I put out some camera traps uh, in, in the colony area as well as in the surrounding reserve <clears throat> just to kind of see what animals we're dealing with. And not surprisingly, uh, there are leopards in the reserve. Uh, these are a few images taken from camera traps on on the reserve. Um, so there are there are leopards, which we need to protect the penguins from. 
as well as caracal, genet, honey badgers, and baboons would also be a problem for, or the genet and, and the baboons and uh, honey badger would probably be more of an issue for the eggs and the chicks, um, but caracal and leopard definitely for the adults as well. So to, to prevent anything, um, to prevent the same, the same thing that happened in the past from happening again, we constructed a predator-proof fence. Uh, you can see it here uh, running along the rocks. Uh, we've, um, <clears throat> sorry, it's about 300 meters long, protecting this uh, main peninsula area or headland area. Um, and it's about two to 2.4 meters high. Um, depending where it is, it's also uh, electrified as well to to just get the message across that uh, predators aren't welcome in this area. And it's a fairly small area, so we're not uh, drastically impacting the, the predator's uh, ability to access food uh, in the area. And it's not taking out too much of their home range, because um, obviously the, the leopards are a, a protected and, and threatened species in South Africa as well. So we don't want to do anything to harm them in our quest to try and save the penguins. So uh, now that we, so this, this fence went up in towards the end of 2018, um, after a long process of uh, getting a management plan approved and um, all sorts of, of environmental impacts assessed and, and that sort of thing. And then came the step to try and actually get penguins there. And so for this, we are exploiting uh, the behavior of penguins and indeed uh, most seabirds, which is the fact that they are colonial. They like to breed uh, in, in large colonies because of safety in numbers. Um, so we also uh, learned from other seabird establishment techniques, which is the use of lifelike decoys as well as uh, playing calls. So the idea is to make it look and sound like there is a penguin breeding colony there already and, and so make it more um, enticing for any passing penguins to come ashore. So I contacted um, the man on the, the right there, his name's Rolf Darling, he's an artist um, and he works kind of at the connection of art and science so he was very keen to get involved with this project and he created these amazing decoys for me. Um, we have two postures, the standing up ones and the lying down to just vary it and also make it look like the, you know, the lying down ones are, are relaxed and happy. Uh, so he made, um, I think in the end it was over 30 of these decoys, they made out of cement and they're hollow so they're not too heavy and then we, we fill them with rocks on site so they stay in place. Um, and so here are a few shots of them sitting out on, um, on the headland. They're dotted around in sort of uh, prominent places to, so that they'll be easily visible from sea. And then the other thing that we have done is put in this uh, big horn speaker to play the lovely uh, musical calls of the tent. So that is going uh, blaring from these speakers 24 seven. Um, and uh, hopefully penguins um, passing by are hearing it. Um, I, I suspect they are. I've been on another headland about one and a half kilometers away and it, you can still hear it. So it's very loud. Um, and I think that, that the sound is very important because penguins being uh, unable to fly have a, a more limited field of vision. Uh, so hopefully they'll, they'll cue on to the, the calls first and then come close enough to be able to see the decoys. So those, uh, oops, sorry, the decoys and the speakers have been up uh, since the beginning of 2019. And the plan was always to, to wait and see if that actually worked and we were able to, to attract the penguins in naturally. 
And then the next phase of the project, uh, if we hadn't seen any activity um, after it was supposed to be one year, but then COVID got in the way. Um, so it, it extended into to a bit longer than that, um, was to start releasing penguins at the site. And uh, because of the, the, the life history that I explained, um, once a penguin has started breeding somewhere, they always return to that spot because that's the only way they're going to find their mate again and breeding with the same uh, mate every year increases their breeding success. So we need to release young penguins um, who will then go to sea uh, and, and spend the next few years uh, growing up and becoming ready, mature enough to breed. So we um, partnered with, with Sankob uh, to, uh, to do this. They, every year they get in quite large numbers of abandoned chicks from the, the existing colonies. Um, often it's, it's Stony Point um, or, or boulders where the penguins are coming from. So they're abandoned um, either as eggs or chicks and then they're hand reared at Sankob um, until they are ready for release. And the Sankov have been doing this for, for many years now, um, and they've, until now, they've been releasing them at existing colonies. And so now we just divert them a little bit and bring them to Duhok. And that involves uh, putting them in, in these boxes and driving them uh, the, the about four hours uh, to, from Cape Town to Duhok, and then uh, carrying them down quite a steep hill um, to the release site. And we released our first uh, group of um, 30 birds in June uh, 2021, uh, last year. And uh, that was such an amazing day. It was a combination of, of a lot of hard work and planning from, from both on both my side and, and Tank Ops, as well as Cape Nature. Um, to, to make this happen. It was, uh, it was an amazing, amazing day seeing these young penguins who actually had, had all been hatched from eggs at Sankob, so they'd never seen the sea, um, just getting uh, into the water and knowing instinctively what they needed to do. So for the first uh, two releases that we did um, in, in June uh, last year, we basically carried the, the penguins in their boxes right to the edge of the water and then allowed them to go from there. Um, this was just kind of to test things out. We weren't sure how everything was going to work. Um, luckily, it all went very smoothly and very well. Um, and yeah, the penguins left uh, happily and uh, hopefully will find their way back soon. We did, uh, we were able to put some GPS trackers on some of the penguins, only uh, four of them, because the GPS trackers are so expensive. Um, but this just kind of gives us a little bit of an insight into where the penguins go uh, once they've been released. So this is the, the GPS tracker on one of the penguins we released last year. And this is uh, the track, the, these are the tracks. So again, each color represents one penguin. And you can see that uh, most of them, well, three of them went uh, sort of west and, and north. One made it to the border with Namibia before turning back. Uh, one, this green one, uh, was more sensible, <laughs> whether it was uh, knowingly or not, um, and hung around um, on the, the southern Cape Coast where there is good uh, availability of food. So while we were happy with the releases that we had done uh, last year, um, when Sankob had another group of penguins ready to be released, we, in August that last year, we decided to, to change the release methods a little bit and to try and keep the penguins on site for a little bit longer and to try and get them to imprint uh, a lot on the, on the colony, to sort of get them to spend time there and and see, sort of get the lay of the land um, before going to sea. So we 
we built this pin um, on the beach, um, and then you can see the, the blue netting it was just a little a shoot to guide them to, to the sea. We didn't want them to just kind of scatter and lose track of them. Um, so we, we built a kind of shoot to guide them towards the sea. So they stayed overnight uh, in, in this pen, and then we opened it in the morning to allow them to go to sea. And they were, they were actually very, very eager. I think they'd been standing staring at the sea most of the time that they were there. So they were very, very eager to get to sea. And we have done two releases so far this year, another 60 birds. Um, so, and we've followed the same method of keeping them on site overnight. We would, once they arrive, they, they get fed uh, and then they get fed again in the morning about an hour before we, we let them go. And that's just to give them a little bit of extra nourishment before they uh, head out on their own and have to learn how to hunt. So I'm, I have just a few videos. Um, hopefully they will play. Um, so this is just a, a time lapse because they, they, although I said they were eager, it can sometimes take them a little while to figure out exactly what they're supposed to do um, to get, get to see. Um, so this is just another perspective. This was from the release that we did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, you can see that none of them really want to go first, uh, but they, none of them want to go last either. So as soon as one looks like it's start, starting to make a move, uh, they all crowd behind. And so this was a group of 30 penguins that we, we released. Um, and then this is just a final shot of them heading into the sea. Um, and they, it's quite incredible, they just know exactly uh, what they need to do. They, although there's, there was some hesitation with this group, they took quite a while uh, to, to make the trek down to the water. Once they're in the water, they know exactly what to do and they just head out to see. It's quite impressive to see uh, and gratifying. So that was um, a couple of weeks ago that we did the last uh, release and we sort of thought that we'd uh, seen the last of penguins for that day. Uh, but then uh, David Roberts, who, who's the vet at Sankov, who you can actually see standing here, he had gone to the end of the, the headland to, to watch the penguins going out to sea and he came back and said, Christina, there's an adult penguin sitting in the rock. And I was a bit surprised and, and sort of shocked. And then he said, yeah, I think it must, must be molting. Um, so we went to look and there indeed was an adult penguin sitting under a rock uh, looking, you can see that its feathers are quite nice and uh, fresh and short. So it probably has just molted. So then uh, we thought that we would just, you know, have a, have a quick look around to see if there were any other penguins hanging around. And to my absolute uh, shock and delight, we found two more penguins, uh, adult penguins, as you can see, sitting um, on the rocks a bit further around on the headland. And I had to do a kind of double take to make sure they weren't, in fact, decoys. And then they moved and I saw that they were real. And I was just blown away. We. <laughs> We, we came back a bit later and, and watched them again and one had moved to sit right next to, you can see this is a decoy and that's a real, real live penguin. And one even went, climbed up a bit of a hill to sit underneath the speakers, the speaker, which I don't know why it chose to sit there. It's very, very loud, as I mentioned. Um, so it seems like the, the calls and the decoys have in fact, worked uh, and we've attracted some penguins to the hook. We don't know yet if they're going to hang around or if they're going to breed, but this is such an encouraging sign. It's uh, making all the, the hard work um, by all the, all the partners, BirdLife, Cape Nature and San, Sankob, uh, worthwhile. And I'm, I'm beyond <laughs> excited. 
Um, and I've, I've now put up, I'm, I'm going to be working on uh, getting some better cameras up in the area so that we can monitor them uh, without having to go and, and actually take a look physically. Um, but in the meantime, I've put a trail camera that takes photos every half an hour. And I've counted at least four penguins. You can see um, each one in, in the red, red circles. There are at least four penguins that were hanging around on one day. Don't be fooled by the, the other things that look like penguins. Those are just, just wolves, very convincing decoys. So although this is very early days, um, we are very encouraged by this um, and hope that they will hang around and indeed start breeding. Um, you can see this pair is sitting quite close together. It might be a good sign that they, they're kind of paired up, but we will just have to wait and see what happens. Um, so yeah, on that very exciting note, I think I will end um, and just with a final uh, thank you to the Isdals and Neville and, and Pamela, who you can see in, in the picture here, as well as the other people who've donated. And I, I haven't uh, put down all the names of all the partners in Cape Nature and Sankob who have been so instrumental in, in making this happen. Um, but just know that they are uh, very valued and important partners on this project as well. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Let me go back to uh, this picture. So. Christina, I, I know you well, we're very good friends. And I also know that you are not always the most expressive and emotional person, but the look on your face when you got to break the news to everyone in the audience tonight that there are adult penguins that made their own way to the work and have, I mean, I mean, four, four penguins is not a colony make, but it is a very, very yeah. good sign. And it's a 10 year vision that you and Pamela have grown and worked on together. And I can only say a massive, massive congratulations, not only on the adults getting there, but all the progress made to this point, the releases of the blues, which we're all holding thumbs also pay off in the next few years as they uh, sexually mature and then decide where to breed. We're all really, really hoping they remember their uh, five-star accommodation in that pen at the work and decide to come back. Um, I think just in the context of the species, um, having another colony spreads the load of that risk across the species. It has, it gives penguins access to food sources that I know from my work on penguins um, in the flea bird team, birds from the west coast are traveling all the way to the work to try and access food sources. So having a, a breeding colony there where birds don't have to travel far to, to reach those food sources is an absolute vital step in conserving this very, very imperiled species. So thank you to you. Thank you to everyone else who's driven this project forward. Um, the seabird team who've supported you. Um, very importantly, um, Pamela and the Isdal Family Foundation who've made this possible over the last decade through their um, ongoing and persistent support. Um, a, ma a massive, massive milestone moment for this project. So well done. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's been a wild ride so far. Uh, we'll see where, it, where the penguins take us. Exactly. All right. So before we do move on to questions, I'm just going to remind everyone that, uh, of course, we have these webinars every week. And next week, we are back with our AV Tourism series on birding in South Africa's major cities. And that is going to be given by Dr. Daniel Dankwitz. Many of you will remember Danny from uh, his presentation on at an elephant park in last year's AV Tourism series on birding in the different national parks. So he's going to be coming back. Um, he's a very well-regarded presenter and bird guide. Of course, those of you who are flocked to Marion will also remember him as one of our expert guides. So great to have Dan back presenting on Port Elizabeth or Proberga. So do tune in next week. Um, for now, just do pop those questions in the Q&A box. I see they're flooding in for you, Christina. Um, mm -hmm. And then if you are watching us on Facebook Live, you can also post your comments in the comment feed there and I will get to those um, in a sec. So let's just start with the Q&A box. 
Um, and there's a, a question from Christine Rodriguez. She wants to know, do adult penguins always return to the same nesting site? And do fledgling penguins come back to where they were born to breed? Um, yes, is the, the kind of simplest answer, um, but it's a bit more nuanced than that. So um, I mentioned that penguins tend to breed with the same mate every year. And the only way that they can find each other again is by going back to the same colony and often the same exact nest or, you know, within a, in a few meters. Uh, so, yes, they do. Once they've chosen where to breed, once they've paired up, they will keep going back there. Um, just because that, that's how they find their mate again. Um, the, the fledglings often do go back. Uh, to, to where they were hatched, but not always, um, as the, the new, newly established colonies um, show. And we're actually learning quite a, a bit more about the movements of penguins through uh, the work that uh, Kata Lujinia and, and colleagues from Sankob um, and a whole bunch of other people are doing um, to put microchips in the penguins now that we don't do the flip abandon anymore, uh, having the microchips is, is a way that we can individually identify birds and be able to see uh, what their movements are between the different colonies. But yeah, generally the fledglings do go back, but they are a bit more flexible in, in choosing a colony to begin with. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to group three questions from Marty, Ted and Penny. And they're also mm -hmm. they're all asking about trackers on the blues that have been released at the work. Um, how many have you put on, and were there any on the latest release? Yeah, uh, so we we put out um, eight so far. Unfortunately, two of them didn't send back any data. Um, so I showed you the four uh, from from last year, and then on the the latest release, we've put out um, two. Trackers. I, I don't have all the, the data kind of collated, but these ones, uh, one of them is hanging around the Still Bay area, and the other one uh, was following that same movement up the, the west coast. Um, but yeah, as I said, the, the trackers are very expensive. They're about 20,000 rand each, so <laughs> we, we can only afford, uh, you know, a few of them. Um, and the, they, they only show us the kind of initial movements of the penguins uh, because once the penguins molt, the trackers fall off and uh, we, they're lost essentially. So it's more the, the later in life movements that we want to know and that's very difficult to, to get a handle on. And um, that's where the, the transponders um, come into play. On that note, um, there is a follow-up question from Ted asking, do you have any transponder readers at the site to check any birds that do arrive? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and no, I don't at the moment. Uh, it is on the cards to put one there, but we're kind of in a very sensitive stage at the moment um, because we need to put it, put the reader where the penguins are, you know, going back and forth to the sea. But that obviously then involves going to put something there where the penguins are now, and we, we don't want to disturb them too much. So we're going to wait and see what happens for a bit and potentially try and find a, a time where we can go and do it without disturbing them. It would be awful to, to have the penguins there and then through disturbance, um, just trying to monitor them, it, we chase them away. So it is in the, in, on the cards, but uh, we just need to find the right time for it. Yeah, I agree. I think in this case, with such an important project and potentially things in the balance, the precautionary approach is definitely the one yeah. to follow. <laughs> um, I can't actually count the number of people that have asked this, so I'm just going to group this question into one. But a lot of people want to know, um, is the site accessible and can people visit? And if not, are there plans for that in the future? Or what's the story? So unfortunately, uh, for everyone who wants to come and visit, the answer is no. Um, the, the colony areas in, on the very edge of Duhurp, uh, in an area that isn't uh, open to the public. 
and we don't have any plans um, for it. So in, in the management plan that I put together with Cape Nature, um, the, the thought was that the, the colony will be so sensitive to disturbance in the first few years. You know, at that point, we didn't know if it was going to be successful. So this was all sort of, if it's successful, the, the colony will be very sensitive in the first uh, couple of years that having any form of, of tourism or, or visitors is uh, was not going to be allowed. So I, yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that. So unfortunately not. Um, but I will have lots of, of uh, cameras around and and be able to share photos and, and videos with people. There's a, a question here, I think slightly tongue in cheek, but I find it quite amusing. Um, Hendrik Smith has pointed out uh, that at the work, there are now both penguin colonies and vulture colonies. And he wonders if that might be a world first. I imagine it should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it probably is. <laughs> I can't think of anywhere else in the world where penguins and vultures coexist. So great, uh, great point, Hendrik. <laughs> Although I haven't ever seen any vultures in the colony area, but they are in the same reserve, yes. <laughs> That they are not too far from each other, actually. Mm, not too far, no. I guess if, if vultures worked out how to scavenge fish, then they might be competing with the <laughs> penguins in some way. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Sue Whitelaw would like to know how many birds do you think it would take to have, in quote unquote, a viable colony? What, what would be success for you? Um, that's something that I've thought quite a lot about. Um, obviously, this this is one level of success, have, just having penguins there. Um, having even one successful nest uh, is also one measure of success, but what we're actually going for is creating, as to put, a viable colony. So I think it would need to be um, at least a hundred pairs breeding uh, on a regular basis um, to to be successful and and for me this is also um, more of a, a proof of concept that we can do this um, and then we can try and and do it in other areas perhaps that are slightly bigger or you know in a in a different area that um, could maybe hold more penguins one of our sort of pie in the sky thoughts is to create an artificial island where there won't be these predation problems um, to create a colony there. So if we can prove that it can be done, then we, we know how to do it and, and can put those techniques to use in future. Hmm. Um, there is a question from Robert Smith about the fence and how the predator proofing is, is made and also a question from Hendrik Smith about how you fenced the, the tidal area. How did you get around the sea coming in and out and, and fence it effectively? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, obviously we can't fence off the whole area because the penguins need to, to get to and from the sea. Um, and we made use of the, the kind of natural topography of the, the site. On the eastern uh, edge of the fence, there's this really nice deep gully uh, that the fence sort of stops at so it's very hard for any predators to to get round uh, there because there's always uh, water in the in the gully on the western side it was a bit more tricky because there wasn't such a convenient um drop off so what we did was um we had the, the fence is basically a big sort of lopsided w and um, so there's one arm that goes down in the middle um to the sea and then continues uh, straight along and then goes down in another point. And the, the theory behind that is uh, that if the predator gets around the one end of the fence, it still has to get through another layer of, of fencing. Um, and also if it's walking and, and hits the fence, it'll walk along the fence line and hopefully be directed away from, from the colony. Great, thank you. Um, then there are a couple of uh, quite insightful questions from Esme Bimish here. Um, she'd like to know, or she, she noticed that one of your penguin releases traveled 
um, up to Namibia. And is it possible that this bird was born up the west coast um, and then traveled west uh, back towards where it was born? And then um, also just sort of related to that, do you know the origin of the eggs that were hatched at Sankov and released at the work? And are you monitoring how that's perhaps affecting their behavior? Yeah. Uh, so I'll answer that one first. Most of the, so Sankov keeps very good records. Um, and so they know where each penguin that we release at the work was from. Um, and so most of the ones that we've released at the uh, have actually been from Stony Point, either brought in as eggs or chicks, but there have also been some from uh, the Simonstown uh, calling boulders or the sort of spillover areas. Uh, so we do know that and we'll be able to uh, keep track because every, every penguin that we release has a transponder chip. So if they pitch up at another colony, um, they will will be able to know that it was one of our releases or if they come back to our colony, then again, we know. Um, so the, the tracks that went up the West Coast, um, all those birds, I'm just trying to think, no, three of the tracked birds that went up the West Coast were from Stony Point. So they kind of went beyond Stony. Uh, and then the other one was from Simonstown. So I don't think they were trying to get back to uh, where they were hatched. This the, the work that Richard Shirley and others have been doing uh, shows that this move, pattern of movement seems to be quite instinctive. They had birds from uh, that were released in Algoa Bay that started you know, going westward and, and up the, the west coast. So it seems to be an instinctive uh, behavior that we're not quite sure why. It seems to be following some kind of cues that, that used to indicate good food availability, but unfortunately no longer do. All right, so we, we are getting close to eight o'clock and I know you are anticipating losing power just after mm. eight to nine eight. So if we do lose Christina, um, don't worry. Uh, she can also see these questions and perhaps reply on email to you for those that we haven't got to. There are a lot of them, Christina. So um, yes, I see. <laughs> there's a couple of questions about birds from PE and potentially those birds that have been released after rehab in Plet. Are they perhaps moving uh, westwards towards the work? Have there been any tracked birds coming this way? Um, we don't have any uh, birds from uh, the releases they've been doing in Plet or from Algo Bay that have been tracked and uh, not juveniles. So we don't know. Um, it's possible uh, that some of them are coming from, from the east. I mean, the St. Croix Island colony has just crashed in recent years. It's, it's really sad to see uh, how those numbers have, have gone down. And um, I, for one, hope that those birds, well, I'm sure everyone does. Um, <laughs> I hope that those birds haven't actually died, but they're still around somewhere. Um, and perhaps, you know, the conditions aren't so good at, at St. Croix now, so the, the fledglings maybe, or birds that have, have hatched at St. Croix are maybe coming and, and coming past to hope and seeing and hearing the, the calls and, and coming ashore. But we don't really know until we, we get that transponder reader out um, and hope that some of the, the birds that are coming ashore have actually got a transponder chip. Now, there could definitely be some fascinating studies on the movements of the penguins mm -hmm. in the different colonies. And, um, of course, this, this the work colony is, is strategically placed almost that you can have birds moving from the western colonies and the eastern colonies and potentially this mixing in the middle at the work. So um, linking up all those different colonies. So as food stocks change and shift, uh, perhaps they can follow those and minimize that risk, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, there's a, a question from Pamela and echoed by a couple of others, uh, Pamela Isdol. And she'd like to know, are you considering doing any more fledgling releases or are you going to put a halt on that now that they're adults at the colony? Yeah, um, we, I mean, the, the plan had been to continue with releases this year, but now that we do have some adults there, 
as I said, we want to avoid disturbing them as much as possible. Um, so we're, we're going to put it on hold for, for a while until we see what's happening um, and how sort of disturbance prone the, the, the birds that are there are. So, yeah, I think we will we'll put it on hold for now. Okay. I think that's, again, the precautionary approach um, mm. fails here when you're dealing with such a sensitive situation. Um, yeah. There is a question from Viv, just to clarify why the fish stock did move that way. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, we're not 100% sure, but it seems to have been some combination of changing uh, ocean conditions. So the, the sea, surface, sea surface temperatures affect where the fish spawn um, and how successful the, the eggs and larvae are of the, of the fish. So there's been a, a change in the the wind and the upwelling um, and also warming of certain waters. So that's that's affected the fish. Um, and then possibly also that interacting with the um, higher fishing pressure on the West Coast. So I mentioned that all of the hub, most of the harbors and fish processing um, capability is on the West Coast. So there is higher fishing pressure there. So it probably some combination of those factors is what has, has caused the shift in fish distribution. Hmm. Another related question from Pamela, um, before you lose some power. Um, hmm. In St. Croix, there's been a lot of media attention obviously about St. Croix and the dwindling penguin population there. Um, is lack of fish one of the primary problems there? And uh, is, is that problem likely to translate over to the work? Um, no, fish isn't such a big problem at St. Um, there, there seems to, well, it's, it, it varies from year to year, um, but it doesn't seem to have been a, a big uh, problem so far. What we think is probably more of an issue is the, the, the harbour and, and maritime developments that are happening in Algoa Bay. St. Croix is unfortunately very close to the harbour um, and they uh, started doing ship to ship bunkering, um, which is where they transfer oil uh, from, it's basically a petrol station at sea. So the ships don't have to dock um, and pay the, the docking fees to, to get refueled. They can refuel out at sea. Um, and um, the manager of the Seabird Conservation Program, uh, Dr. Alistair McInnes, has been doing a lo lot of work with. Um, with a whole group of people on this issue, looking at what impact. So the, the bunkering has caused a massive increase in the ship traffic in Algoa Bay. So he's been looking at what impact the increased ship traffic and, and, and ship noise has been having. Um, and so we think, and also the increased frequency of oil spills in that area. So we think that there's a whole, combination of, of factors to do with the expanding developments around the harbour in, in Algoa Bay that's, that's affecting the penguins at St. Croix. Okay. Um, there's a question from Benita Reed on Facebook, um, I guess, segueing off the, the ship traffic and that in St. Croix. Um, obviously, the work is a marine protected area, so are there any water pollution issues to be aware of or is it mostly fine? Um, not as far as I know, uh, there's unfortunately, I think along our whole, whole coastline, there is uh, quite a lot of plastic that comes ashore at Tahoe, but um, there's, you know, there's no big towns nearby, uh, there's no, no harbours really, so I think the risk of, of oil pollution and, and that kind of thing is quite low, uh, luckily. Um, and that's one of the, the other things that attracted us to, to working at Duhurp was its uh, relative remoteness from those sorts of issues. Great, thank you. A uh, question from Mike. Have you considered keeping the penguins at Duhurp for longer before releasing to better imprint the site on them so that they may return as if they had bred there? Yeah. Um, that is something that we've discussed quite a lot and um, it just becomes much more logistically challenging the longer you have the birds there uh, because they need to be fed and uh, cared for obviously the 
And the longer that they're, they go without swimming, the more or, or the less waterproof their feathers become because they become, you know, they get guano on them or fish oil from, from feeding. And so their, their feathers become less waterproof. Uh, so that can impact them when they do go to sea. So it's a kind of balancing act between trying to keep them there long enough to imprint and also not affecting their condition. But it is something that we we are discussing. Um, and it, it would be good to, to kind of, uh, we are trying to keep treat this as an experiment in a way um, to to see what methods work. And so it would be interesting to to release a few groups of penguins after having kept them there for you know three, four, five days if we can. But that's something we'll we'll have to consider if we if we do start releasing again um, once we know what's happening with these adults. Two quick questions around your cameras that you're using. Mm -hmm. Um, the first is what kind of trail cameras do you use? And the second is, is there an internet link that people can log into your cameras and see what's happening? Hmm. Uh, so for, I'll take the second one first. Um, no, not at the moment. Um, there hasn't been anything worth seeing <laughs> on the cameras. And, and most of my cameras currently look at the fence just to make sure that, you know, there's nothing, uh, nothing happening. Uh, with the fence line, um, it's something we can maybe consider in future. Uh, yeah, it's it will be quite logistically challenging. There, there's no uh, cell phone signal at the colony, so I've put in in satellite uh, um, internet there. So, yeah, it's it's possible in future, but I'll have to to think about it and discuss with with all the project partners. Um, in terms of trail cameras, uh, I have a variety there. Um, slowly, they've been out for quite a while, so they're slowly uh, falling apart. Um, I was using little, little acorns. Um, I also have a Bushnell camera out there. And um, quite interestingly, I've got a couple of cameras that were actually being used in Antarctica. Uh, and they're, called, they're Reconics. Um, so they, they were being used by the Penguin Watch program where they, they set up cameras to, to look at colonies of um, Adelis and, and Gentoos. And then there's a citizen science project where people can go and count the penguins that they see. Um, and so these cameras were no longer suitable for their Antarctic conditions, but they still worked fine. And uh, uh, Tom Hart was uh, good enough to donate them to me to use it to hope. So. I've got penguin, uh, cameras that have been to Antarctica. <laughs> Amazing. Those cameras have seen quite a different number of penguin species by now. Yes. <laughs> last few questions. Maybe we'll get through them before we lose you. Um, yeah, the lights are still on. Yeah. Amazing. All my fingers. Um, Shane Bennett would like to know, do seals pose a problem in this scenario? Um, in general, seals do pose a problem for penguins and um, around certain colonies, there's quite a lot of predation um, by seals at sea, not just on penguins, but also on, on Cape Gannets at, on, on the West Coast at Malchus Island, especially. Um, so yes, it is, it is an issue and there are seals in the area. Um, one, of, one of the things we looked at when we were looking for, for suitable sites was you know, how far away the site was from a seal colony and it's actually quite hard to get quite far from a seal colony along the, the South African coastline and um, the seals have seemed to have been expanding the, the increasing the number of colonies so they are busy establishing new ones um, so yeah there is unfortunately um, a seal haul out um, nearby but it was almost impossible to find somewhere uh, that was suitable for penguins to breed that also didn't, you know, didn't have seals. Um, but it's something that we will monitor and, and see if it becomes a problem. Um, it seems to be a learned behavior, the predation. So um, it can be managed uh, as long as um, kind of the problem seals are, are taken care of. And there's a question here from Elton Bartlett asking about sardine run um, and the number of sardines that are taken out on the famous sardine run and if this is having a material effect on the penguin population. 
Um, no, I don't think it is. Uh, and the reason for that is that, uh, so the, the fisheries department are, are doing quite a lot of work on looking at the different um, stocks or seeing if there are different stocks of sardine along the South African coastline. And it seems like there are potentially two, possibly even three stocks of sardine that are separate. There's a West Coast, a South Coast, and then uh, the sardine run sardines seem to be different from those two. Um, and it's it's just a subset of the, the sardine population. Um, and it, I don't think it has a big impact on, on the penguins. Um, unfortunately for the sardines, they're, they're migrating to an area that's not suitable for them. Um, so they probably, unfortunately, all, all would die anyway or get, and we've all seen those amazing images of all the, uh, predators on the sardine run. Um, so no, I don't think it, it has a big uh, impact on the penguins. It's also out of the range of, of most penguins. Um, most penguins don't go much beyond sort of East London. Um, although they do, some do end up at the sardine run. It's not a, a major food source for them. Great, thanks. And there's, there's one last question here um, from Loretta Boshop Gibbons and it's a nice one to end off on because she's basically asking, how can people help? Is there a way mm. to volunteer? Are there things that you need? Is it funding and donations? Um, is it spreading awareness? Um, yeah, there's there's not much that I need at the colony at the moment that you know it may change in future. Um, but as I've said <laughs> many times, we're trying to manage disturbance, so there's not much that that can be done at the site now. Um, but, you know, if that changes in future, I'll, I'll definitely let people know. Um, funding is always uh, something that we, we need, especially now with, with penguins arriving. Pamela Isdal has been amazing in, in supporting the project and uh, bringing in some of her, her contacts in, to donate as well. Um, but with, with penguins having seemingly arrived, we will need to expand our monitoring um, and I need to replace my, my trail cameras, which I mentioned are breaking um, and add some more cameras uh, to be able to monitor the penguins. So uh, if anyone is in a position to donate, they are welcome to, to get in touch uh, with me or, or any um, BirdLife South Africa staff and, and we can direct them uh, on, on how to, to make that donation. Great, thank you so much. Um, that's it. I don't see anything else on my second screen on Facebook, nor in the Zoom Q&A. So we've lasted the whole way through without losing you, which is great news. But even yeah. better news that there are penguins at Dewoop, um, both released and naturally being uh, brought into the site through the different acoustic and um, decoys uh, that you've been using to, to draw them in. So. Amazing news tonight. Thank you for sharing that with us. Incredible work so far over the last 10 years, I think it is, 10 plus years at, at BirdLife South Africa. Um, yeah, you're a real champion for penguin conservation. We're really, really lucky to have you here. And I know that everyone in the audience tonight and, and watching this later on YouTube appreciates the efforts that you put in. And of course, I think another last thank you just to, to Pamela. I know she's in the audience now. And, um, her, her long-standing and very generous support as well to make this all possible and, and sharing the stream with BirdLife South Africa. Um, any last parting words from you, Christina? Um, no, just uh, thanks everyone for, for listening and, and all the, the comments that have been uh, streaming in on the, the chat feed. I haven't been able to read them all, but I will later. So thank you very much everyone for all the support and, and just to echo um, your thanks to Pamela and everyone else who has donated to the project. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, and also to the Sankov and Cape Nature teams. Um, it's been amazing to, to have a, a very supportive project team and, and also the, the seabird conservation team and the rest of the staff at BirdLife. So thank you all very much.